All right, welcome back. So this week, me and my friend Daniel Zamoyski are going to be discussing metaethics, which is essentially what is good and the nature of good, as well as how we get there. I'm going to lead off with an apology. Neither I nor Daniel really understood what happened, but his audio file, the raw one, has a bunch of spikes in the sound recording. So I'm going to do my best to mediate that, but you're going to have to bear with us for this episode and the second part of this episode. So in this part of the episode, Daniel presented his view on what is good and what he believes is good. He also gave us an overview of his beliefs that consistency are the root of making well-informed, intuitive decisions when it comes to moral decision-making. And all of this was backed by Harry Gensler, which is an author and a philosopher of the textbook that we studied in the class that we were in together, but as well as Henry Sedgwick, who Daniel says is his favorite philosopher. The episode he covered cultural relativism, supernaturalism, as well as egoism, just so that you guys had a more well-rounded view of a couple different options that you could be using when it comes to moral philosophy. So hopefully you guys enjoy this week's episode. The first part is obviously happening right now. The second part should be out quite shortly afterwards. And I hope you're enjoying the second season so far. Thank you, and we'll talk to you later. Okay, so it has been a while. Um, I had a semester, two semesters of school to get through. Kale had two semesters of school to get through uh, with basketball. So we took a break from the main series, from the real learning. But we're back. It's the second season. Um, I honestly don't know what order I'm going to be releasing these in. But I am blessed to be joined by my friend Daniel Zamoyski today who I met in my philosophy class earlier in the year, and I'm just going to let him tell you a little bit about himself and his background and why he's here to talk with us today. So, Daniel, how are you doing, my friend? All right. Thank you, Keaton. Uh, I'm doing pretty well today. Um, I've also been really busy with school. Um, My semesters have been pretty tough. But uh, like Keaton said, I met him last semester in a moral philosophy class. Um, I'm not... A moral philosophy major, in fact. I don't specialize in this, like, academically. Uh, I study economics, which is, like, only distantly related. Um, but for me, moral philosophy has been a guiding part of my life ever since, you know, I figured out that you can actually think deeply about this kind of stuff. Um, I didn't go into it academically um, from the beginning, so I started out with opinions and beliefs that I still hold on to this day. Um, But in the moral philosophy class that me and Keaton took, we definitely built a more broad understanding of ethics and what moral philosophy can lead lead us to um, in our daily lives. Um, So in this episode, um, me and Keaton are going to be discussing um, meta-ethics, which is um, you're taking ethics, you're taking what's good, but you're going one level above, you're going on the meta level, and you're trying to figure out um, what is the nature of good, like when you say something is good or bad. How do you define that? Um, do you need that? And how? what is your methodology? Like, what is your logic in order to figure out, you know, what is good? Um, we're, we're going to be talking about that for um, a pretty long time, about, you know, why we should care about ethics, about all the different ways of defining good and getting to good, um, about the reasoning mistakes that I think people make, and about the way, um, the preferred method, I think, for, you know, thinking ethically and in terms of metaethics. Right. So I've spent a large portion of my year this year really circling with the question, um, just pertaining to myself, if I am a good person, am I acting in a right moral ethical stance? And like Daniel said, like the class we took really it, it wasn't everything, obviously, because mm-hmm. there's yeah. endless, endless options, but it was a pretty comprehensive view, and it gave us a lot of different frameworks to work under to try and determine whether we are acting ethically, morally, and I really think, first of all, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to come do this, um, but I really think this is going to be productive for me, because I remember at some point during the class, and I don't know if you attest to this now, you describe yourself as a moral absolutist and I am not that way whatsoever. So I I think 
there's going to be some places where we fundamentally really agree on things because you're just a sensible human being. And I know like you've thought everything you stand by through, but I also think it'll be a good time for us to pick each other's brains. So um, if you want to talk a little bit more about the nature of good, go ahead. Don't let me stop you. You're doing great. Okay, um, yeah, before we get into, you know, what what good even is, we have to talk about, you know, how we get there, how we think about this logically. Um, so, in metaethics, really, what it is, is the approach of finding and defining good, or right, or whatever word you want to um, pin as, like, the ultimate goal. Um, when you when you when you're thinking about this philosophically when you're thinking about this rationally you really want to make sure that you have really good reasons for everything that you're really thinking everything through um this isn't something that um people do generally i find um it's not something that you see um really anyone do except for maybe some communities on the internet that care about ethics or if you are literally you know you have a doctorate degree in philosophy you specialize in ethics right. um then maybe you might care a lot um but generally people have their principles and the things that they've learned um over the course of their lives like for example stealing is bad right so it's ideas like that and to um, a large extent, that's sufficient for most people's needs. That's sufficient for what you need to get through through everyday life. Um, but if you're ever going to be in a position of power or you're ever going to be in any kind of morally gray situation, or if you're trying to see where your society right now is currently spreading injustice, currently being immoral, um, you need to have a better foundation than just what you've learned from other people like stealing is wrong you need to have an actual solid foundation and you know i personally believe there's there's um places where you know where people act in a morally gray way and they don't really think about it there's places where um society right now is really unjust and really immoral and people just accept it because everyone else does but i feel like um having these strong metaethical principles allows us to move past that but before we get into like the normative stuff um i'll be talking about you know how we actually get to good and what the, that logic is right um i see um morality um and all of this kind of stuff in a in a rational type of way um i feel like it's something that can be quantified and it's something that's rooted in logic and this is a view that's shared by a lot of um political uh, not political a lot of moral philosophers like for example um our in our class our textbook author was uh, henry gensler and he shares this view that you can get um, morality through logic and through self-evidence um so let me let me paint a picture um of the simplest kind of morality involving only one person now this might seem outside of the boundary of morals because it's only one person but just bear with me for a moment okay um let's say let's say you're um, a student and you have a goal and your goal is good grades um there's ways to act that are objectively um aligned with that goal and there's ways to act that are objectively bad if that is your goal but anyway um if you're a rational student there's certain ways that you'll act you're gonna study um as much as you can um and if you are rational you can't get around the fact that you need to study to get good grades, right? And if you don't study, you're objectively acting irrationally. I think this is like an assumption that everyone can accept. Um, so this is self this is a self-interested rationality or egoism, as you as some people call it. Um, and basically, on the whole, you're trying to make yourself as well off as possible, as much meeting your goals as much as possible, and experiencing as much pleasure and as little pain as possible, what, however you want to call that. Um, but morality is like, what if n is greater than 1, right? Um, what, what should you do then? My belief um, that I'll touch on later is that you apply the same logic to other people. One of my favorite philosophers that we only briefly touched on the course, but I'll be mentioning it a lot, Henry Sidgwick, um, his thoughts on it was that um, you can't ever say that your good is more important than someone else's good. Right. Because good is a fundamental property. Right. It's something that cannot be reduced further. Um, 
the, the, there is no way to clearly and fairly say your good is better. Um, there is no logic that um, applies to that self-interest, egoistic type of thing that doesn't also equally apply to the good of other people. Um, and what ends up happening logically, um, it's a little bit of a logical leap, but to me and to Gensler um, and to um, Sidgwick, it feels inconsistent um, to not take that logical leap and to not only act in the rational self-interest of your own goals and your own pleasure, but also that of others. Um, what ends up happening is a lot of people obviously don't accept that morality is objective. Um, there's two things that I'll say to this. Moral objectivity versus subjectivity by experts is hotly contested. Um, and I don't think, and I will not try to convince you or your viewers that you have to be a certain way when it comes to moral objectivity. Um, if you feel uncomfortable accepting that there's moral truths that are part of the universe, that's perfectly okay. It, it feels like religion. Um, and philosophers um, try to get around it in a minimally invasive way, as they call it. They try to make it so they're not making some huge claims about morality existing in the universe, but they're only making slight claims about logic. But either way, um, I don't think you have to accept that morality is objective in order to accept my thesis, which will be that consistency um, is the core element of morality and what good is. Okay. Let's go into simple ways of defining good. Um, what are some ways that people like generally just tend to say, yeah, this is this is probably what's good. The first way that Gensler mentions is um, what he calls cultural relativism and other forms of relativism. So to explain that in simple words, um, basically you have your, your word good, your definition good or right or whatever, um, and you define it in terms of um, what my society or what culture accepts or encourages is what is good. Um, this is obviously a good way of defining good in, in one in one direction because um, because in one direction you can account for cultural differences you can account for people valuing different things in different cultures like for example if one culture really values um, money and wealth you can say that money and wealth is good there and people will be happy pursuing that because that's what their culture encourages but in another culture if it's family that's more important over anything else and then that's what's good there. Um, so cultural relativism at first seems really, really strong, um, but there's a really simple, like, logical answer as to why you cannot just define good in terms of what so society and culture accepts, um, and that's because society contradicts itself. In any given society, there's people on both sides of an issue. Um, and also, if a society encourages something like uh, sacrificing children, which has happened in, in the past with certain societies, um, you might find that morally abhorrent. Um, and this is, an, this is a way of determining good. Uh, you can see what I'm doing here is um, I'm giving you an example and saying, you know, this technique doesn't work with that. Right. Um, and I'm, uh, so we can see that um, cultural relativism doesn't really work with what we want. Not only um, can it lead to morally abhorrent outcomes, like saying, for example, sacrifice is good, but also it contradicts itself because you can have, you could also easily have a society where a big value is not believing in what society believes in. That's completely self-contradictory. So from a logical perspective, even though for children, cultural relativism might seem like the way to go because society teaches them things, um, from a logical, philosophical perspective, it's not sound. So, like, I think... There isn't much more to say um, other than cultural relativism can be very appealing uh, on face value mm -hmm. because if you have some hope or some reason to believe that a majority of society has the right idea or is acting in the benefit of you and everybody else, then sure, what society approves of could potentially be good. But the example you gave with sacrificing children, as well as just racism, you know, mm, like yeah. society has been wrong multiple times. So I think it's very clear that while this could be appealing at face value, it needs to be developed a little more to be acceptable. So mm -hmm. I absolutely think that 
um, what other people think can be a factor in determining what is good. But as long, um, this is what Sedgwick does, and we'll get into this later, as long um, as you make sure it's reasoned belief and it's justified um, why, you know, uh, uh, the majority of people that you do look at are justifying why. Um, so Sidgwick, for example, when he um, says something is objectively true morally, he looks at what other educated people, um, like himself, for example, believe in. Um, with society, um, the problem isn't that people are dumb or can't reason morally, it's just that society is composed of thousands, millions of people, um, and there's and, and um, ideas just spread out of control, right? There, you can't like control and make everyone logical um, in that sense. So um, we've developed, we've probably um, enshrined now that cultural relativism is not the way to go when it comes to discovering what is good, what is right. So let's try a different technique. Um, let's say what is good is what God desires, mm -hmm. what God wants. Mm -hmm. um, so we can divide good and we can define good this way. Um, this is the um, meta-ethical method called supernaturalism. At least that's what Gensler calls it. Also known as divine command theory, if you want to search it up later. Um, so with supernaturalism, um, you have a really convincing core argument, or at face value, a really convincing core argument, like cultural relativism. But in terms of um, getting you to good, I be um, believe it doesn't get you anywhere, and I'll touch on that. And also, um, Gensler, who was himself religious, so it, this is not an atheistic pos position at all, also believes that supernaturalism is um, inconsistent. I agree. So, with supernaturalism, um, it's really appealing to say, you know, what God desires is good, but um, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, Socrates, um, you may have heard of this, uh, famously came up with Euthypro's Dilemma. And Euthypro's Dilemma is a really, really simple objection to supernaturalism at face value. It basically asks, you know, is good what God desires, or does God desire it because it's good? Essentially, you're asking what comes first, the goodness or God? Um, if you're a supernaturalist who is also religious, um, you might say, of course, God comes first. Right. But remember, right, it's the same thing with cultural re relativism. There's, um, there's a morally abhorrent hypothetical I could think of right now. Let's say God really, really um, likes sacrifice. Um, does that make sacrifice good? A lot of people would be, including educated people, would be inclined to disagree that that would make sacrifice good. Um, so people try to also say that um, atheists exist, right? And they have a sense of morality that doesn't involve God. And that's also a fairly strong objection to supernaturalism, because if you can have goodness without God, as atheists seem to do, um, then, you know, supernaturalism seems to fall apart. Some people try to modify it. They try to say instead of um, what is good is what God desires, they try to say what is good is what the highest available wisdom and love desires, what the ideal observer would desire. Right. Um, and this, it, this it is slightly better in that it avoids the atheistic objection, that because atheists, of course, could have a conception of the highest available wisdom, but it does not solve Euthypro's dilemma. Take Euthypro's dilemma, is, is it what God desires or is it what's good? And just replace it with God with highest available wisdom. So it doesn't solve that at all. Therefore, it remains contradictory, at least according to Gensler. Um, and a lot of Christians um, and Muslims, etc., um, when it comes to ethics, they don't fully take supernaturalism at face value. They go for a natural law method, where there's laws of good uh, that God created, but that are fundamental and are not, and the whole thing where good is what God desires doesn't hold. So what are your thoughts on supernaturalism? Keith? Um, I think... It could be very endearing, especially if you are somebody who lives, um, uh, what is the word? Is secular the right word, or is that the other one? <laughs> secular would be the atheist. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, theologian? Hmm. Right? Yeah, if you're religious, or... Yeah. yeah, okay. So, if you're a theologian um, of mm -hmm. some sort, then... I can see why it can be endearing, and I understand 
the logic behind it, but there's so many inconsistencies because if you present to an atheist and to a God-fearing man who are both educated and rational human beings, a situation where it's like killing this baby is good because I say it so and I am speaking from the place of the creator. Both of those people with a rational mind should be able to agree on the removal of life in almost every circumstance is, or every circumstance is abhorrent. So if people can agree on those, I think the big issue is, is do actions, do virtues, do people have inherent goodness or inherent badness? Is there inherent character or does that come first from the creator? And I think even with the modified supernaturalistic view and the ideal observer theory that you brought up slightly in the end there, the modifications help the argument, but at the end of the day, you can't really get around the fact that I believe and I believe where you're coming from, at least from what I've understood so far, is that actions and virtues do have inherent characters and that there are moral objective truths um, but I will allow you to flesh out that argument more. If you really, really want to figure out, you know, what is good, what I should follow and how I get there, um, then cultural relativism and supernaturalism probably don't get you far enough, not in a rational, satisfying way. So we really need um, a way that seems at least fairly logically sound to try and figure out what these objective truths are. Um, assuming, of course that we ha there are objective truths, mm -hmm. which is a very big assumption. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be smart about it. Um, but there's been a lot of people that are really, really smart over the years. Exactly. Um, and they all disagree. Um, every single moral philosopher disagrees on something. I remember um, seeing the, uh, there's a philosophy journal that does uh, statistic, uh, statistics, that surveys, sorry, there's a philosophy journal that surveys um, philosophers um, that study ethics. Um, and they ask, um, what do you believe in for your normative ethical theory that you use to guide your life? And it's literally split 30, 30, 30, or one third, one third, one third between utilitarians, non-conscious sequentialists, and other, and mixed. So... There, among the experts, there's a lot of disagreements, um, but I will try and present my view later on as best as I can. Um, and I'll try and show, you know, why you need to use logic and reason um, and why no matter what you end up leaning towards, whether morality is true to you or just something you say, that consistency will be what's important. Right. Um, I think I can agree with those uh, like wholeheartedly, uh, whatever you decide to believe, regardless of whatever field it is in your life, as long as you're being consistent and you've made this point already, making sure your ends justify your means, I believe you can act quote unquote morally good, ethically good in most of, if not all of these, uh, philosophical frameworks. But the thing is, is that I know you value rational thinking and logical thinking and I agree with you when it comes to finding a philosophy that may not replace your religious beliefs but is the cornerstone of your morality and your ethical stance there needs to be some logic some rationality in the one that you choose because if not I would be inclined to believe that sometimes your moral decisions might be flimsy then but that's just my two cents. Absolutely. Um, think of it, think of it uh, as you're an engineer. Um, as an engineer, you can't afford to deviate from the truth. You can't afford to make mistakes. Obviously, um, if you're not an engineer, you're just thinking about morality. You can make one mistake, right? But think of it like an engineer, right? If you're an engineer, you have to make sure that all of your calculations for the structure you built or whatever are done right so that they equal each other, that they equal out and that um, the logic, the mathematical and physical logic behind your production makes sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, your model, your calculations 
deviate from the universe, they deviate from what is likely to be in a sense that's going to be um, really, really bad once you actually get to building that bridge. When it comes to moral or rational morality, um, you won't be able to know for sure. Like if you're wrong, um, you don't get instantly punished by God. There won't be a lightning strike that strikes you down. But it's, I believe the same um, logic, the same kind of science almost um, would apply here. You want to make sure that um, you're being consistent and that your logic pans out in the end and hope that that is what is actually true and right. Exactly, exactly. Because there's only so much that you can know until it's happened. So I'll let you go on, continue making your arguments, because I feel like you're presenting a pretty compelling case as of right now. All right, so moving on to the more philosophical stuff, um, the better ways of metaethics, of getting to good. Um, the first one will be intuitionism. And this is the one that Sidgwick prefers, and Gensler pl praises it as well, and is one that, that I prefer as a meta-ethical method. Okay. Um, so Before you begin, do you yes. mind just explaining to the people what you mean by saying uh, intuitionism. intuitionism as a methodological method, or okay. whatever? <laughs> so, sorry. Um, so with intuitionism, um, it's a way of getting to good, that I feel is based in logic and that also supports the existence of objective truths. You don't have to accept this, um, but it's the way we're going to go about it. Okay. Um, I'm not going to explain what intuitionism means just yet. I want to get into one right, more thing right, before right, we right, do that. Right. But uh, just keep this big phrase in your mind, intuitionism. Um, let's go to David Hume for a second. Really well-known philosopher. You don't need to know anything about him, but you should know this if you don't already. Um... And David Hume once said, a really famous saying, that you cannot derive an ought from an is. Um, let's say you have a statement A, and a statement A is like, this child is crying. There is no logically valid leap that you can say, that you can make to say, you ought to console this child. Um, you can say you can say that, but there's no logic in between right. that... Um, is that completely, you know, um, covers all the possible bases. Because someone could easily say, the child is crying, you ought to kill the child. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would accomplish some kind of goal because the child would not be crying anymore. Um, but you can see how um, there's no real way to get from, you know, the what you see um, to what you should do. Right. Um, which means that when you're looking at good, you can't actually go any further. You can't go into the physical world. Good then becomes something indefinable. And it becomes something that you have to reach, not from natural observations, but non-naturally. And what I mean by non-naturally, I mean through logic. Okay. And that's what intuitionism says. Intuitionism as a methodolo methodology for metaethics is how you get to good using logic okay. um, and using intuition. Okay. Now you might say... Well, if you're getting to good using intuition, well, I think my intuition is that stealing is wrong. Um, but, you know, there might be some cases where stealing is right. Um, so what am I supposed to do? You're in, these intuitions are all wrong. But intuitionists um, are actually more strict than that. They think that your intuitions need to be extremely well thought out and applicable in a variety of different areas. They need to be agreed upon by other experts kind of like cultural relativism, but in a more uh, sane way. Um, and they also need to be internally consistent. So intuitionists like myself, they believe in moral principles, intuitions, you could call them, that are objectively true. But they also believe in moral intuition. But these moral intuitions that they believe in, sorry, are basic. They're as basic as you can get, because you can't say something like stealing is wrong because obviously there might be some situation where you need to steal just to feed your family. And I think a lot of people would agree that's right. Um, the way that intuitionists um, discover moral truths are through self-evidence. Remember when I was talking about engineers? Right. Um, 
if you're an engineer and you're doing let's say some kind of algebra for whatever reason you really want you want your two to be equal to two you want your x to be equal to x on both sides of your calculation um to oversimplify um but this is how gensler how sedgwick see um moral logic mm -hmm. um in the same sense as mathematical logic you want your two to be equal to two on both sides you want to make sure that your moral principles are self-evident right. and obvious just because of the way they are right. they should be obvious to anyone who's mature who's educated so what are your thoughts so far on into on intuitionism before i get into sedgwick um personally i think just like the first two, it's very appealing at face value because I'm a biology student and from what you've said, the moral objective truths that intuitionists buy into need to go through some sort of a peer review process. It need, they need to be widely accepted. And I think that is very, very important when it comes to coming to some form of the truth, maybe not the whole objective truth, but getting closer to it. Um, my biggest issue is that intuition is relying on just that, intuition. So where do your intuitions come from and how do you know your intuitions are not misguided? Is there another form of protection from deception other than the peer review process? Or, I don't know. Those are a couple of the questions that just come up. Yes. That's actually really perfect <laughs> for what I want to talk about. Because I want to talk about how Sidgwick um, takes, at least in my opinion, in the opinion of several other famous philosophers, Peter Singer, Katarzyna de Lazari, the Lazari Radek, etc. How Sidgwick takes the scientific approach to intuitionism. So... In order to reduce your chance of being wrong with what you say is your intuition, what, with what you say is your basic moral fact, um, Sidgwick puts out these criteria um, for reducing your chance of error. Now, Sidgwick is somewhat of a moral objectivist. He thinks that um, his axioms that he puts forward, um, his intuitions, are true. Um, but he also says you know, these criteria only reduce my chance of being wrong. They don't eliminate it entirely. But here they are. Firstly, um, your basic moral principle has to be precise. It has to be clear. It can't be self-contradictory. You have to reflect on it carefully. So there's no emotion involved. You must spend time on it. If you just got robbed and you say stealing is always wrong, um, out of emotion, out of an emotional outburst, you know, you m it might might not entirely be true, right? right? Um, all of your principles, all of them, all of the basic ones at least, have to be mutually consistent. This is probably the most important one for Sidgwick. Mm -hmm. and, and also other mature, educated people must be in general agreement with your basic um, intuitions, with your basic moral principles. So you kind of see how Sidgwick is approaching this in a kind of scientific way, trying to reduce error, trying to reduce bias. Mm -hmm. um, so where does Sidgwick get to um, with all of this? I think that there's a really beautiful parallel between where Sidgwick gets to and where, um, where science and scientific theories kind of trying to get to, and that's simplicity. Right. Um, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to physics, advancements in physics, have not been, have not really been insane amounts of measurement and insane amounts of data science. The really meaningful and huge advancements have been discoveries of simple or relatively simple calculations and equations that describe a seemingly complex universe. In science, a lot of advancements come from simplicity, come from finding the simplest possible answer that actually explains the logic behind what's going on in the world. And for Sedgwick, um, he also aims at simplicity. So his um, conclusions are that you have these really abstract principles. When people, when you talk about nor the normal intuitions of people, something like, um, let's say, well, what's something that people think is good? Knowledge, mm -hmm. um, pleasure, um, what else? Uh, Su happiness. Success. What else? Success. These are things that people generally, like common sense, think is good. Um, Sidgwick thinks that, you know, you need to have a way to 
deal with conflicts between these right but you also need to have a way that actually accounts for all of these right um a more abstract principle and here are his principles um the first one is universalizability um so kind of difficult to say but he's essentially saying, kind of in the vein of Immanuel Kant, um, if, if you want to look at more universalizability stuff, um, he's saying basically that any basic principle has to apply to everyone. So if one of your basic principles is, or one of your um, just principles in general is success is important, you have to be willing to let other people succeed. Um, otherwise, you're, you're, you've lost it. Like, you're not um, in tune with your logic. If you say that, you know, all people with short hair should be beat up. You have to be willing to accept that if you have short hair, you're going to be beat up. But, you know, in practice, no one's going to accept this because they also have goals of, you know, not being in pain, etc. Um, another basic principle that Sedgwick values, in addition to universalizability, is prudence. Um, what he calls um, neutrality, not just um, universal neutrality, but neutrality across time. If there's... Um, if there's a child now that you care about, their suffering is really, really important, and they're going to feel that um, if they're suffering, right? And let, let's say, like, they cut their hand. Their, their suffering is really real in that moment. But if you have a child 20 years from now, um, and they cut their hand, that suffering is no less real. And if you were that child, you'd be feeling it the same way. So probably you should probably not cut the hand of a child. That is probably immoral. But you should also probably not leave... A shard of glass on the ground so that a child a year later comes by and cuts their hand that's equally right. immoral so you have to take into account not just um universalizability but also time and the last one the most important one is um benevolence um so we've tried to be consistent again uh, universally we've tried to be consistent across time the third pillar is we're trying to be consistent across persons this is something sedgwick struggled with because he said he didn't have any real way to go from maximizing your rational self-interest to maximizing the universal self-interest to um, defining good in terms of everyone. Um, I feel like Sidrick was kind of wrong in saying that. I feel like there's really good logical reasons for it. But And that was another pillar of his, is benevolence. Mm -hmm. So with these three pillars, um, prudence, universalizability, and benevolence, you have your basic objective moral principles.